Um, I think everybody's found a seat, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here today. My name is Caitlin. I'm the executive director here at the Matheson History Museum. Um, before we get started, I've got just a couple of things. Um, first, I want to thank the sponsors for our program. Um, we are funded in part by Visit Gainesville Alachua County, the State of Florida Division of Cultural Affairs, and the City of Gainesville. Um, that grant funding is what makes part of our exhibits and programs here possible, and then you are what makes the rest of it possible, um, our members and donors. So thank you to those of you who made a donation when you registered for your ticket. We really appreciate that. Um, we also have back here at the back table, Willett, um, who would love to talk to you about becoming a member of the museum if you aren't already. Um, I also want to invite you, uh, this is the museum's 30th anniversary year. We opened to the public on March 12th of 1994. So we are celebrating that two weeks from today on March 9th. We're having a sock hop here in the museum. Um, tickets are $30. You get a discount if you're a member, $25 for members. It's going to be a really fun event. We'll have live music from the Imposters, catering from Hills Barbecue, a signature cocktail from Mix Maven, and it's just going to be a really great um, party to celebrate the 30th birthday of the museum. Um, so I really hope that you will come out and join us. There were some flyers on the chairs, and then there are also flyers in the back, um, and then more information can always be found on our website. Uh, so that is all of the business that I had to take care of. Um, so now I would like to introduce our speaker. Um, Dr. Kenneth Suak is a, re a research fish biologist who retired in 2016 from the U.S. Geological Survey. He has published extensively on marine fish community ecology and sturgeon life history and conservation. He has 50 years of experience researching fish ecology in all sorts of different types of waters. And the last 25 years, he spent as a fish ecologist for the USGS. Um, so we are now going to have the privilege of hearing from him about the Suwannee River. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our speaker. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you. And how do we, can you start that? Music not playing? Oh, uh, it worked a little while ago. Well, we can skip the theme music. All right. Well, there's a very appropriate old song called Grandma, Grandpa Tell Me About the Good Old Days. And uh, so I usually have that for a little lead in while people are talking in the audience and kind of gets things started. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, North Florida, a Swanee River watershed, more or less, and uh, talk about early settlers who came to North Florida, mostly after it became a territory. So these people were arriving in the 1820s, the 30s, and 40s, and then a lot of people came down into Florida after the Civil War. So Oh, yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I always forget about that. All right. So I'd like to paint a picture of North Florida from back in the 1800s. And the early settlers here came mainly from South Carolina and Georgia and a few other places. Most of them walked. They didn't have a whole lot to bring with them. They usually had the family cow that was pulling the wagon. All their stuff was in the wagon, and the kids would walk along, and they wound their way through the 27 uh, million square acres of uh, longleaf pine from Georgia down into Florida. Some came as single families. Many came like this as multi-family uh, clans with uh, three or four wagons and everything that they owned, a bag of seed and some basics to eat. And uh, also there were lone men who came seeking work or wealth or escape from the law. Now what? 
Ah, uh, okay. So people followed old trails into Florida that came down through South Georgia and into what was before 1820 was Spanish North Florida. There weren't any roadsides back then. You really didn't know exactly when you were in Florida. Uh, the people wound their way through the forest along Indian trails, which eventually became wagon roads. And uh, they uh, used what, what the signposts were available back then. And those signposts were trail marker trees that the uh, Paleo Indians and Neo Glacial Indians had formed like this one here, out of oak trees when they were saplings. This is a big old swamp chestnut oak that's located at the conjunction of what was Old Providence Trail or Alligator Trail going from Myco Town on the Georgia border down to the Alligator, which is Lake City, down to Newtonsville. I don't know what the Indian name of Newtonsville was, but this particular tree stands right at the at the intersection of that trail and what was the old Spanish trail, the in, which followed an Indian trail that went east-west from St. Augustine to Pensacola. And this particular tree is about 220 years old, and it points directly to the natural bridge across the Santa Fe River. It's telling you where to go and what direction to take so you don't have to get your feet wet going across. And Mr. Tom Murdy was the one who informed me about Old Providence Trail, I believe. Yes. Oh. Okay, so where were these settlers heading to? Where, why did they come to Florida? Well, in, in the um, law of primogenitor, English common law, the oldest boy gets everything. The rest of the family, which they needed quite a few of to work the farms up in Georgia and South Carolina, got nothing. So you had to move and leave the, the home farmstead and find yourself a piece of land. Well, almost all of Georgia was taken up. And so where did you go? You came to Florida when it became a territory. And this particular territory in this darkened ellipse is where they were headed. And why they were headed there was that this, that area had very rich soil from 5,000 years of longleaf pine forest, a really thick needle bed that degraded and burned and rotted and produced a very rich soil. And you can see where they were going even today because all of those red dots in the lower green ones are major water withdrawals permitted by the Swanee River Water Management District, which tells you where pretty much where all the farms are. So the farms are still where they're sort of uh, semi-elevated land that's not swampy, it's not dry ridges, and it's not scrubs. It's the place that's good to farm. And this whole area was generally known as Alachua. Alachua went, went from the Georgia border on down to Bradenton at that time. That's an Indian word, and it, it, it described that territory and encompassed the counties that are are parts of the counties that are listed above there. And where not to go? Well, you didn't want to go down by the Gulf of Mexico where you had nothing but swamps, and you didn't want to go up by the Okanokee where you had bogs and swamps, and you wanted to stay away from those dry ridges between here and the St. John's River. And so that's the places where you didn't want to go. Um, and uh, you can see in uh, when they were going, they had four different surveys of the border between Georgia and Florida because there was considerable controversy about who actually owned the land there. And it wasn't settled until 1878 after the Civil War and Congress finally decided where the line was. Uh, but one of the early surveys of the border, this fellow Alexander Allen had something to say about that area up there that says swamps and scrub. He said it was one of the most desolate and sterile regions on earth, a dreary waste that can never be inhabited by man. So, yeah, anyway. So finding and trekking through Florida meant that you had to cross rivers. If you're coming into Florida, you're gonna to have to cross the Alapaha or the Upper Suwannee or the Withlacoochee 
you know, to get anywhere down into where you want to go, down into that rich land territory. And so early on, there were several uh, ferries established right at the border, the Roebuck Ferry and the Knight Ferry, which were off the Alapaha, the Blunt Ferry on the upper Swanee right at the border, the Beaufort Ferry on the Withlacoochee in 1827. So those ferries that are highlighted in yellow were some of the earliest ones. And uh, if you know the Swanee River system, you know the, the rivers are carved into the landscape, into the bedrock, and they're fairly steep-sided. So they're not easy to ford. Once you step that first step into the river, you're going down, unless you find a place where there's a ford. And uh, almost all of these ferries were established right where the Indians had had a ford before that. Okay, so you wanted to follow those Indian trails and stick to the dry ridges. Don't get your wagon bogged down. And you wanted to take those in those river crossings that the Indians had conveniently marked by trail marker trees. Uh, people came down the Oki from Oki wagon trail, which skirted around um, the to the west of the Oki from Oki swamp, uh, or they came down what was called the Old Salt Road from Georgia into Florida, and that went to that wound its way down to Steenhatchee, Deadman's Bay, at the time. And the reason it's called the Old Salt Road is that before Florida was a territory and then a state, farmers from Georgia used to come down in winter with a wagon and come down to the coast and boil down salt in big kettles, salt water in big kettles to make salt to put in barrels to truck back up to the farm so they could pre preserve their uh, meat and fish for the rest of the year. That was pretty important. And that became a, a major trail for settlers after that. And you had going east and west what was called the Federal Road or the Lower Mission Road or the um, El Camino Real. It be, be, later became Bellamy Road. Fundamentally, an Indian trail that went east and west from St. Augustine to Pensacola and down to St. Mark's. And these fords and ferries fords, uh, became ferry crossings. They were critical to get to Alachua and basically to buy or squat on federal land. Most people squatted on the land. They didn't have the money to pay a dollar and 25 an acre. And so they would farm the land for four or five years, wear out the soil and move to another place until they finally ended up buying a place. And everyone had to come to the Newlandsville government land office to register your patent when you eventually did. Uh, some people, some families squatted and never registered their land. The last one that was actually registered was in 1954. So, <laughs> a fellow in the family realized that he, that the land could have been bought out by anyone uh, from right under him. Uh, th these crossings were marked uh, in a lot of places by these trail marker trees. And this is a really elegant one here. This is a water um, pecan or a swamp pecan, and it's been deformed when it was young and has two pointers. One points due south and one points due west, and there's three uprights on this tree. And what this means is you've got a three-day walk to the west, which takes you directly 60 miles to St. Mark's, which was the most important Indian trading post in Florida, where you can go due south three days for 60 miles, and you end up directly at the mouth of the Suwannee River. So these trees carried a lot of meaning. So this map shows some of these trails coming into Florida, the dashed lines, uh, the salt trail there in the middle, the green are Indian towns, the town of Maiko and Alligator and Newmansville. If you were coming down to actually follow land patent, that's where you would come. You come down Alligator Trail, Alligator Road, go to Newmansville, register for a land patent and then get out of Newlandsville as fast as you can because it was a notorious place for ne'er-do-wells. Uh, the Old Salt Road shown there, and there were some other trails like the Old Town Trail that were important for people getting from one place to another. Oh, and there's a, these are the big salt kettles that they used to uh, boil the salt down. 
So what was it? What was the landscape like when these settlers came? Uh, like I said, there weren't any roads. You had these Indian trails. The Indian trails wound through the forest, and they didn't necessarily go straight. And the forest was longleaf pine with an open understory, very similar to a redwood forest out west, except along the rivers you had cypress. And the cypress was big and old, up to 3,500 years old, and up to 17 feet in diameter and 200 feet tall. And so it, along this, this is picture in the middle is along the lower Suwannee River and back in the 1800s. And those cypress trees were set so closely together that they formed what was called a break, meaning you couldn't walk through there because it would break your your, tra your travel. And this is a, on the right side is a very nice uh, trail marker tree that marks the uh, the uh, ford across the Rithlacoochee River, a fossil coral platform that's only about ankle deep at low water uh, at a place called Rossiter's Ferries. Where this ford was, subsequently the ferry was put in right there. Unfortunately, somebody cut this tree down. And it's on state property. <laughs> Okay, so these settlers found a pretty daunting longleaf pine wilderness, and you were, wanted to clear about five acres, which is all a family could manage to farm. About what do you do with these trees that were up to five feet in diameter? Basically, they girdled them and then around the trunk and allowed them to die and waited for them to fall over or burn them and farmed around them. I mean, you, if you actually felled one of these trees, what would you do with it? I mean, you'd weigh a hundred tons. And uh, a water, the water management district at Tom's here, again, I have to mention, we has some very nice sections of longleaf pine. This is a two foot diameter longleaf pine that was uh, cut and the rings counted and uh, started its life in around 1500. And it was a 288 years old when it was cut. And so you can imagine what that log that's on the on the cart there that was five and a half feet in diameter you can imagine how old that had to be so maybe somewhere between 500 and a thousand years old so if you think you've seen a big longleaf pine tree you haven't <laughs> they cut them all what we had lost okay so the settlers cleared a small piece of land and eventually that ended up clearing part of the of the forest but the big tree, the big uh, lumber barons from up north came down fundamentally once the railroads arrived in the 1860s and began to uh, commercial industrial logging and logged out uh, every last piece of virgin longleaf pine and, and bald cypress. And these, uh, you can see the size of these are pine logs, one log on a truck there, and this particular tree in three sections on three railroad cars from the California swamp cut by the Burton Schwartz Lumber Company in Perry. There's three sections of that and they totaled up to 204 feet. And where, it, where they topped it, it was still 16 feet in diameter. So it gives you an idea of what, what the forest was like. And this was all uh, pulled out with uh, high wheel log carts or with skitters on rail spurs or with little donkey engines that were on rail spurs. And so they used the oxen and mules and skitters and rail cars and small locomotives. And what you had left uh, when they were done is shown over there. And that's actually from down on the lower Swanee as well. Uh, Another lecture on that is a complete ecosystem flip that occurred when that happened, as you can imagine, when you cut all that ancient conifer forest and it was replaced by aggressive, rapid growing hardwoods, oaks mainly. Now, every family that came down had its own story to tell. They came mostly on foot until after the railroads, but even when the railroads got here, most people did not have the money to come down on the railroad. So they were pretty much walking. And this, this is an interesting story that was typical of the period after the Civil War. This fellow 
uh, oh, Henry Franklin McCray uh, and his buddy were in the Civil War together, and they made a deal that you know if my, if I get killed, you marry my wife and whatever. And so Mr. McCray asked his fellow Confederate soldier, Mr. Thomas Jefferson Stewart, to marry his wife if he got killed, and he did get killed. And uh, so after the war, Mr. Stewart. He married the lady and uh, they had nothing. They had a cow, that was it. And so he made a cart and uh, had the, hitched up the cow to it. They had a young baby at the time. They had a bag of cornmeal, some lard and a few coins. That's all they had and they headed south and they needed those coins for the ferry tolls back then. Uh, Mr. Stewart built that cart and, and uh, on the way they ate berries and they fed the baby with cow's milk. They probably crossed the Alapaha River at Kirsch Ferry near Jennings, but then went over the Swanee at the Zipper or Charles Ferry on McCormick Ferry to get to Alton near Mayo, and that's where they ended up. They ended up in the, in Lafayette County, squatting at first and, actually, and later acquiring 160 acres by the 1862 Homestead Act, but they didn't file their deed until their patent until 1903. And the reason for that was Mr. Lincoln had a clever ploy in 1862. They got Congress to pass the Homestead Act, which sounded like it was something to provide people with land, but what it was really was was to bribe rebel sympathizers not to fight for the Confederacy, but to join the Union Army, because then you could claim some land. So there's a interest. So uh, most of these families squatted and they waited till the old Civil War veteran died, in particular here in 1903, and then they went and finally filed a, a land claim. Now, most of these settler families were large, and they came in multiple family groups. Uh, my wife is a descendant of this, fam this Townsend family over here on the right side. They came down to Alachua and Newtonsville, and then they headed over to what became Gilchrist County in 1859. And there's a picture of the extended family back then. So, uh, if you were gonna work a farm and you didn't have slaves, you needed a big family. Uh, without fertilizer and irrigation, the soil was depleted rapidly in the three to five years. That, that virgin soil didn't last long. And the main crop was corn, which particularly good about exhausting soil quickly. So a lot of families abandoned their homestead, moved to another one, kept moving south, and a lot of them ended up in South Florida. And uh, um, these these uh, families were large, so they had progressive and multiplying impacts upon the land. Uh, the Townsends here, some of them remained in Gilchrist County and are still there, and, but a bunch of them moved down to Central and South Florida. So there's a trajectory here of, of uh, increasing prosperity and property that these settler families went through. And, you know, they got their five acres of land that they could farm, their, their 40 or 60 or 120 acre claim. And basically they were growing corn, cane, and collards with a little bit of uh, peas and sweet potatoes thrown in. Uh, the corn and cane were for the family and the collards. If they had the wherewithal, they would also grow cotton and tobacco so they could sell and get some cash money. And when they got a little more prosperous, they would get into cattle and citrus as they moved south. So we start off with early small farmers uh, on a small plot of land, growing the subsistence, living, and uh, also harvesting wild game, bush cattle and hogs. And as they acquired land and, and money, they would go into cotton and tobacco, and the big families would acquire slaves and become what was called planters, or move south and become ranchers and growers in cattle and citrus. And over, with this transition in time, in the river crossings, we started out with fords, and then ferries rapidly uh, supplanted that, and then old timber wagon bridges, and finally steel bridges around the 1890s. Most of these people that came came on foot, 
foreign wagons. But this enterprising individual, George Jennings, who came from England to Georgia, came down the Lapaha on a raft. He, when he came to Georgia, he rapidly found out that there wasn't any land that he could acquire. So he decided to come to Florida. He left Cow Creek, Georgia in the 1830s and he had a partner. They loaded everything they had onto a raft and headed down the Alapaha River. And uh, they did okay until they came to a place that's now called Jennings Defeat. <laughs> and the reason it's called Jennings Defeat is that the, rapid, the rapids can get pretty bad there. And uh, their raft got upset. They lost everything and they almost drowned and they crawled up the bank and had the good fortune of being wrapped in the Indian village of Maiko, which was between the Alapa junction of the Alapaha and Alapahoochee River. There's a fellow that had preceded them there, Daniel Bell, who had a trading post. And so they they uh, settled, these two fellows settled there, but eventually they had to leave because the Indians kept stealing everything they had. And so he moved a short distance away to a place called Jennings Bluff and uh, settled there. And uh, that's where he's buried along with a lot of his descendants. If you haven't been to Jennings Bluff, it's worth going to. It's almost a 60 foot drop from the top of the bluff down to the river, it's quite remarkable. Some settlers uh, decided that farming really wasn't their thing. And uh, they headed to the swamps and they became swampers. And uh, they mostly these areas of fringing the Gulf in Lafayette, Dixie, Levy, Taylor, and Madison counties, they lived by hunting and fishing, running woods cattle and feral hogs, and they'd have a small garden. Some of them did some uh, turpentine work. And a good story is told by uh, Cosette Lewis Sessions in her three volume history of Lafayette County settlers. And this one is the Roger McKinley family who became swampers. They, moved from Georgia, from South Carolina to Georgia and then to Florida in the 1840s. And they wanted to keep up the South Carolina tradition of growing cotton and becoming a planter. Fella had two slaves, uh, he eventually set the woman free. Uh, the man stayed on with him after the war, but they couldn't make a go of it with cotton. So they gave up, moved down to Cook's Hammock in Lafayette County and took up life in the swamp there. It's just a, built a cabin live mainly of game and fish and a, a rounding up of bush cattle once a year. Now you could make a decent living back then doing this because fish were plentiful. This is a little a short net here between two skiffs at the mouth of the Swanee, uh, fishing for mullet, incredible two boatloads of mullet from a net that's probably less than a hundred feet long. Uh, there's a morning's catch there at the Odlin Island at the mouth of the river in the middle. Even if you're a little kid, you could load up there. These two kids in the 1890s, or you could go for alligators or bush cattle, chicken turtles, whatever. It was a great abundance of wildlife at the time. Makes you sad when you go and try to catch a fish these days. <laughs> now, finding for these early settlers, were largely self-sufficient, hardworking, and alike, and religious and resilient, and wanted to become respected citizens. However, Yankee visitors who came down to visit Florida had a different opinion of these folks. They found them to be scraggly, lazy, ill-dressed, whiskey guzzling, hard gambling. I gave this lecture one time in in Alachua, and the folks said, "Oh, it had not not much has changed." <laughs> Uh, this fellow Bishop Henry Whipple came down and he had he, he described people as all sorts of ingenious rascalry and a common ground for Southern black leaves. And Mr. Tappan, who the bridge was named after in New York City, he, he had oh, the people, oh my, the rough scruff of civilization. And uh, Northern white soldiers who were stationed down here in the Seminole Wars, uh, they had a, they, they had a, refer to uh, Florida as uh, hell on earth. And uh, Rachel Jackson, Andrew Jackson's wife, who when he was the military governor of the territory of Florida, uh, she described Florida as a vast howling wilderness. Oh. 
Frederick Wormerton, a famous uh, Cal uh, Western artist, had a, also an equally poor in opinion of Florida cracker cowboys. These folks didn't realize, however, that you know you didn't have a hardware store around the corner. You couldn't go out and buy lumber and build yourself a nice house, and you know things were. You had uh, sort of a rough, scruff life. Anyway. And actually, these industrious builders for them, and by and large, there were some guys who were but ultimately, these homesteading ha families had great impact upon the development of, of Florida. And uh, like I said, they had no saw lumber, hardware, tools, etc., handy for them, so they had to do everything themselves. So your first house were made out of palmetto thatch, this one stuff thrown together or there, sort of a tent thing. Your first house was kind of a hasty shelter until you could get things going. But eventually they built nice uh, frame houses and, uh, and did quite well. Now, finding Florida in the 1820s to early 1900s meant going across ferries quite frequently. Uh, you needed to go across ferries to get just about anywhere, and there were a lot of ferries. There was one about every 20 miles on the river, and that's because 20 miles is about as far as you can go in a day with a horse and buggy and, or a wagon and get back home. And uh, But the ferries were not cheap. The day laborers wages, if you could find day labor back then, it was 11 cents a day. But to cross the ferry with a two horse team and wagon was 50 cents. So you had a week's worth of wages to cross the ferry. And Florida law said you had to pay in cash. And people had very little cash back in those days. Uh, so if you work, you choose your trips wisely to go across the ferry because it cost you, uh, unless you happen to be a member of the ferry family, like this Townsend Ferry, where this fellow had a girlfriend on the other side, and he went back and forth quite a lot because he could go for free. So this shows where some of the ferries were. Those yellow highlighted ones are at the border with Georgia, and these ones that are in black boxes are traced down the course of the Swanee, the Withlacoochee, the Alapaha, and the Santa Fe. And uh, there were, over, the, over those years, ferries at 61 sites in the watershed, uh, operated by over 120 different ferry operators. Now, Fairman, the reason for this hat is the ferryman was out on the river working, but he was a rising gentleman. He wanted, he could get cash, which was a rarity, and he could become prominent in the community because he was a, he was important. You had to get across the river and keep in his good graces, and he was a source of news. He was usually the postmaster, often became uh, the mayor or sheriff eventually, uh, and so he uh, always wore a, a tie but a short one so it didn't get caught up in the machinery. And a long sleeve shirt and suspenders. Because he was uh, he was working out on the river, but he wasn't going to get dirty. And and, and uh, he wore a straw top hat. And the top hat had a function, and that was to let people know who that ferry operator was. If you were on the opposite bank and you were trying to get the attention of that man, you'd look for the guy with the silly looking tall straw hat. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for reminding me. Okay. And this is a picture of the Irvin Ferry, which operated up by Laurelville, close to Mayo. Mr. Washington Irving right there. And he's pulling that rod. He's pulling against the cable to pull that ferry flat across the river. And uh, this is that very device. Or re reproduction made by me. But so you had to grab that cable and pull that ferry flat and whatever was on it across the river, which could have been several bales, 300 pound bales of cotton or a horse and buggy loaded with covered barrels, whatever. 
anyway, the objective was to be a ferryman for five or six years, accumulate cash, and go go out and buy as much of that land as you could for a dollar and twenty five an acre, and become a a uh, planter. Now these ferrymen had a reputation as being grumpy, irascible, and absolutely unforgiving. You had to have cash, and so uh, I wrote a poem about this. So I'll read this. Cross that Florida line, baptism of the border. And this is about Appleton Rossiter's ferry up on the Withlacoochee River. Appleton had a reputation of being a tough old guy. God bless that feisty ferryman down on the Florida line, going to cross the Withlacoochee and leave damn old Georgia behind. God bless that cantankerous ferryman carrying me and all of mine, going to get me 40 acres for the flatwood pine. Don't take no cracker barter, says he. I ain't no credit giver. It's cash on the barrel head, son, or y'all can swim the river. Fellow took our last two, two big coins, took our last thin dime, but God bless that feeling, straw head gent. He got us across the line. Now we're not done yet because surprisingly, not all ferrymen were men. Some of them were women, and this little gal here, Miss Ida, she pulled that ferry across the river at Horton Landing at uh, Dowling Park for a long time. And uh, her, um, her uh, uh, that ferry was owned by uh, John Horton, but John was a, a professional soldier and was rarely home. So he wasn't operating the, the uh, ferry. It was operated by his sister and then by uh, the daughter. And this lady lived about a third of a mile east of where the ferry landing was. The ferry landing is still there. You can go and walk down to it. And across the way, the other side is a boat ramp, it's boundary bend boat ramp. And uh, legend has it that she had a metal tub on the opposite side of the river, on the western, on the Lafayette side. And there was a metal rod or a wooden bat there. And you had to bang on that tub until she could hear you on the other side of the river and then she'd come down and take the ferry across and pick you up. And so she deserves a poem too. So ferry ladies deserve a little long. Ferry man's a lady at Horton Ferry Boundary Bend and the town was then known as Hudson on the Swanee, which became Dowling Park. Trekking down from Red Dirt, Georgia, Alachua, Alachua County, country bound, Got across that Swanee River just north of Hudson Town. Old wagon carting all our goods, tired milk cow pulling on, walked them moonlit piney woods, making boundary bend by dawn. Curtain ferry, bang on the tub, so red the wooden plaque. Papa banged away, we meant to cross, ain't no looking back. It took a while, but later on, an old body limped down the bank, stepped on the ferry, spat out a chaw, and gave the rope a yank. Mama stared hard across the water through the morning fog, and finally she exclaimed, her eyes and mouth agog, never thought I'd see the day, the world's done gone crazy. Unless the eyes deceive me, the fairy band's a lady. All right. Anyway, so what is this ferry? Well, the ferry was a cable stretched across the river anchored to an oak tree on one side and an oak tree on the other side. And the ferry was a, a, a wooden flat, basically a, a barge which had ramps on either side so you could lower those to load up a wagon or later on automobiles. And there were a couple guide posts sticking up that, that ran along the cable and the ferryman would pull on those and they could adjust the angle of the ferry relative to that to those got to the cable, there was a structure known as an oar board, like a keel that stuck down below the ferry and caught the current. So you could let the current push the ferry halfway across, and then you had to pull the rest of the way. And this is my recently departed friend, Farrell Michael, back in 59 at the uh, Rock Bluff Ferry with his puller, very similar to that one. And uh, the ferryman is behind him with a tall straw hat. That was uh, Truman, Truman Fowler, known as Bear Fowler, uh, with his signature hat. 
There was an art to doing this ferry loading and unloading. And when you're on one shore, you had to load the vehicle, pull it all the way to one end of the ferry so that the stern of the ferry would lift off the bank and you could get it out, to pull it out in the water. Then you had to, to, to balance the load in the middle. And when you got to the other side, you had to do the reverse so, the, so that the, uh, you could offload when you were landing. And there weren't any thing to hold the these uh, buggy or vehicles on there. There weren't any chains or wheel chocks or anything like that to prevent roll-offs. And so later on, when when motor vehicles became a thing, uh, Dr. Irvin Philpot and another fellow, Len Barber, both drive their automobiles right off the, and into the river at the ferry ramp. There's a story behind Dr. Philpot. He originally went around three counties in his horse and buggy his horse was smart, knew the way back, and Mr. and Dr. Philpott liked to drink. And so on the way back, he would sit in the buggy and drink and let the horse do the work, take him right to the ferry. But then he bought himself a Model T. He didn't change his habits. And so when he got to the ferry, he was not in good shape, and that's how he ended up in the water. <laughs> So I give you an idea of what these ferries look like. They were called reaction ferries because they were reacted to the current of the river to, to get you tack the ferry across by adjusting the cables. And these there are various options for that. All of these ferries were pulled by hand. And the last one closed in 1965 at Rock Bluff. And the one previous to that, that's Rock Bluff up there. And the one below that is at... Uh, a crab ferry, which was in operation from about 1820 until it ceased operation in 1954 when they built the new bridge across the river at Fanning Springs. Uh, these ferries were critical during the Seminole Wars for settlers. Uh, they needed to, to hunt from home and get to safe haven, and there were a number of stockades and forts built along the river. Uh, at Blunt's Ferry, there was a fort similar to this one shown here, built basically a stockade where everybody could retreat into. And uh, there, the ferry there was used to get people across and give them a little time and protection against Indians coming, Seminole Indians coming from the west uh, to attack the fort. And during the Seminole Wars, ferries also moved soldiers, militia, and supplies across the river. And so some ferries were established specifically for that purpose, such as Reed's Ferry on the Swan on the Santa Fe River, and Cason's Ferry also on the Santa Fe River, and others. Oops. Well, got a repeat. Ah, okay. Ferry land and ferries and ferry landings were also popular places for social gatherings. The ferries were closed on Sundays, of course, and they only operated from dawn till dusk. If you wanted to go across at night, you had to wake up the ferry operator, and he's not going to be happy, and you would have to pay him extra then if you were going to disturb him. Uh, so you could. This is the, that ferry that closed in 1954. This is a sign informing people that. It's not open on Sunday. Uh, when they weren't open, however, this is, a, a, again, at Rock Bluff in the middle, uh, this photograph, a tall fellow there is uh, Irv Hilliard, who was the ferry operator, again, in his straw hat and his suspenders. And uh, he would take the ferry out and into the middle of the river, take kids out there and let them fish off the ferry on Sundays. Uh, there's another, uh, ferry landings were popular gathering places, that picture on the upper right is, is the Heart Springs area where the McCrab Ferry went across and it was used for occasions like the 4th of July shown here. And also the, this uh, the bridges later had the same function. Uh, traffic was light, so you know you could have a party in the middle of the bridge, wouldn't make any difference. And this was a winter excursion party here on the old stagecoach bridge at Dowling Park. It's an early steel truss bridge with a wooden deck. And as time went by from the, by the 1850s or 18, uh, 
80s, almost all the ferries were gone except for a few that were state operated free ferries. Uh, this and the old timber wagon bridges, like this really nice one here that went across the Withlacoochee River at, at the border, at the Georgia border. Uh, and this tall, kind of ten, kind of shaky looking bridge that crossed the river at White Springs. Uh, those were all made out of timber. And also this trestle, which was a camp lumber company's trestle at White Springs. Those rapidly got replaced by steel truss bridges. Again, the early ones had wooden decks and they were mostly built in the late 1880s through early about 1910. Uh, they didn't, they were built for wagons. They really didn't anticipate automobiles and Henry Ford's Model T went on sale in November, 1908. So what happened was very rapidly, uh, that a lot of bridges collapse because all of a sudden they were driving log trucks and turpentine trucks and all kinds of things across these bridges, which weren't built for that. And the bridges also got weakened, like the Cone Bridge up here and the Lowerville Swing Bridge by floods, like the big flood in 1928 and the other big flood in 1948. So these Bridges didn't last long before they needed to re be replaced by something more substantial. Now, those early fords and ferries and bridges were important and railroad trestles. They connected the people in the rural counties with plantations and farms and the uh, wrist mills and turpentine stills to nearby towns like Gainesville and Jacksonville. Uh, this is a picture of two uh, cracker cow hunters who herded cattle from Madison County forded across the Suwannee River near Rock Bluff and drove them into Gainesville down by where uh, the Lachua Trail is to sell and, uh, and to load onto the railroad. Um, the picture on the upper right is a turpentine still at Townsend Ferry uh, where they were loading naval stores and they were turpentine and rosin to uh, headed for Lake City, Gainesville or Jacksonville. And this picture down, it's an old, uh, one of the early steel bridge, one of the earliest steel bridges, the Adams Steel Wagon Bridge in the lower left crossed the river, uh, high over the river at White Springs. And uh, the bridge on the right is still standing. That was the Drew Swing Bridge Railroad Trestle that crossed uh, the Suwannee near Lowerville, it's still there, surprisingly, a uh, hundred plus years later, frozen in place. Settlers also needed lumber and shingles and uh, for building their house and barns. They needed supplies from mills and general stores and the ferries and bridges were what got those things back and forth across the rivers to them. Uh, this is a typical early mill here, one built right at right at Columbia Spring in High Springs, uh, Abner Dunnigan saw and grist mill in 1895. He built a dam across the river there to catch logs coming down to, to, uh, to uh, dress into lumber and shingles. Uh, I believe he had a, a ferry or some sort of flat to get his products across the river there, but eventually he and his brother and some other folks built the first bridge at Timber Wagon Bridge in 1900 across the, the Santa Fe River at, uh, at, at High Springs in order to get his products, his lumber and shingles from Columbia County. The mill was on the, mill was on the Columbia side over to Alachua County. Now, the bridge, it, there's a three, there was a, a swing bridge built at uh, Fanning Springs. It was called the Three County Swanee River Bridge. It only lasted for about a decade. It was a big factor in the creation of Gilchrist County, which split off from Alachua County. And this has some, if you're familiar now, there's a move to separate out a county called Springs County from Alachua County. Uh, the residents back then at the, what was called the West End of Old Alachua County were upset in 1921. They wanted a good road built from Gainesville to Fanning Springs. They wanted the 
county to build for it uh, to pay for a turn bridge operator to operate the turn bridge so that steamboats could get through but they wanted to, to be exempt from the no fence law because they wanted to let their cattle roam free and they wanted a portion of the county racetrack revenue which is something i which surprised me and uh, so they appealed to the county commission in 1921 and they were rudely rebuffed <laughs> and and they reportedly were laughed at at the, at the commission meeting uh so they decided to take things in their hand as a bluff mainly so they petitioned the legislature to create a new county and uh they really didn't intend that to happen they were just trying to pressure the Alachua county but surprisingly in a special short session that was going on the legislature voted to approve that and so the county eventually became officially gilchrist county in 1925 Fanning Springs eventually got that new road about 1929. The turn bridge built, turned out to be a red herring. By the time it was finished in 1923, that was the last year that steamboats ran the river. So you really didn't need a turn bridge there anymore. And uh, that uh, bridge was really not suited for heavy motor vehicles. It was built, it was a timber bridge built on steel supports underneath. The steel supports were donated by the Cumber Lumber Company, which had cut out all of Dixie and Levy, south, the south end of those counties. And uh, mysteriously, it's mill burned down, which they all did for insurance purposes. <laughs> and, and they gave their bridge to the town of Fanning Springs to use as the super, the understory structure for the wooden turn bridge. Well, and uh, that bridge is similar. I have no pictures of that bridge, but it would be similar to these. This is a turn bridge, a highway turn bridge at Lauraville and a highway turn bridge at Steen Hatchie. Uh, anyone knows of a picture of the, the old turn bridge at, at Fanning Springs, I'd sure love to have it. There's an irony in this three bridge story. Uh, they, you gotta be careful what you ask for. So they suddenly became their own county and they had to have their own sheriff and court and school board and highway maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which meant, oh, and also they separated off from Alachua County. So they had to pay for their portion of outstanding debt for school and road and whatever bond were out there. It took them until uh, the 1940s to pay that off, 1941. And by the time they did, it was uh, $1.4 million that they owed to Alachua County. So uh, Springs, Advocate, Springs County advocates, be careful what you ask for. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that's uh, pretty close. But uh, anyway, and there's supposed to be a haunting fairy song play right now, but you can imagine that. I have a few more slides. Ah, so I'm looking for help. Anyone who has pictures of old bridges, particularly any of those early bridges across the Santa Fe, which somehow seem to have never gotten photographed, except for the one that I showed that was collapsed, uh, the any of the log railroads in the lower Swanee, at Cumber, Til Tillman, or Usher, Usher log railroads, the Fanning Springs, that three county swing bridge, uh, steamboat landing at, at Wani and the ferry and the railhead, et cetera. Any, I'm, uh, a lot of these bridges and ferries and bridges were in existence after photography got established in the 1880s, but there are very few photographs of them. And also, I want you to keep your eye out for trail marker trees. All right, so if you see an odd tree that's been bent and shaped like this and this shows you how they did it they took a sapling bent it over tied it down cut off the original trunk and let a side branch grow upright to make that shape and these i've, not, I've found 14 of these so far in north florida and folks have let me know about four others that i need to go out and check on this one's on the blue hole trail at itchy Techni state park uh, and these are other different places. This one's in the River Rise at Santa Fe. Uh, 
And that old tree up there in the upper right is at Swanee Springs. And it's about six feet in diameter, probably about three or 400 years old. And it's no coincidence that the ACL Railroad Trestle was built right there because that was originally an Indian Ford and then marked by this tree and uh, right where a wagon trail was developed and then original and then the railroad. All right, thank you very much for your interest. So we're gonna take a couple of minutes for questions. Um, we do have people watching online, so to make sure that they can hear the questions as well, um, I do ask that if you have a question, you come and speak it into this microphone. Um, so while you all are gathering your courage to come to the front, we've got a couple that have already come in through Zoom. Um, so we'll start, uh, we have a bald cypress on the canal where I live in Floral City. Are bald cypresses rarer than the others? Excuse me, I, I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. Are are bald cypresses rarer than other bald, other types of cypress trees? Are they rare? A bald cypress, well, back in, there's 37 million acres in Florida. 27 million of those were longleaf pine back before 1800. And the rest were mostly bald cypress. Uh, bald cypress wasn't rare, but it was distributed in places that were low and wet, like cypress domes, or along the rivers, or around sinkholes. All right, we've got a question from the back. Yep. Yes. I can come this far. <laughs> it's very interesting. I know you've been to Wani. There's not much there anymore except the Swanee. That was once the terminal of the Atlantic Swanee River and Gulf Railroad. That's right. I have three annual passes from them from the 1800s. I'd be happy to copy them and send them to you if you could use them. All right. That would be that would be really good. So uh, I'll get your ad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Tom Murphy brought in an artifact from one of the Dowling uh, Park bridges. Uh, anything that people end up giving to me, I end up uh, forwarding on to a museum. An appropriate museum. Their route was Stark to Wani. That was their route originally. That's right. Right. That, I've been to that. If, if you go to that same Wani landing when the river is low, mm -hmm. that that was a steamboat landing that was over a hundred feet long. All the pilings are still there. Right. You can see that. And the railroad siding came down and and went parallel to that, so they could offload from the steamboats to the train or vice versa. And uh, that's also the site where there was a later on a uh, gigantic alligator farm. I don't, did you know about no, that? No, I didn't know about that. At one point, the country of Israel bought 3,000 alligators from that particular place. Wow. Well, I don't know what they were doing with the alligators, but uh, there's a fellow that lives right there. This fellow lives right there, right where the road ends and splits to the right. Yes, I'm familiar with that. That fellow knows a lot about the history of that place. I forget his name. Sorry. Good story. Thank you so much. Yep. All right. I've got another question um, online. I read that George Drew took his steamboat to Old Spencer's Tavern. Do you know where that is? I know about George Drew, but I don't know where Old Spencer's Tavern was. No. <laughs> Thank you. That was very interesting. I have a, a silly question, but when they crossed the river and during the Seminole War, they went into that building that was not quite a fort. What did they do with the cows? Did they stay outside? They swim them across. Yeah. So they did where? They would swim the cattle across. If it was shallow enough to, to uh, you know, the, the cattle could walk across. And there are places in the river that are like that. Uh, there are very few, but there there are places. Uh, otherwise, I'd swim them across. As a matter of fact, there's a, a place, uh, a ferry that's south of Dowling Park. It was the called the uh, one by a fellow named Robert Smith. His descendants still live there. And uh, it was called the Seed Landing because the steamboat would land there and offload cotton seed. And so, and that's close to a town that's now very small called Day. And the, the railroad went right through day 
Oh, I thought you said Dade. I'm sorry for my eye. <laughs> What's that? I thought you said Dade. I was oh, like, Dade. Yeah. no, Dade. Can, can you repeat your original question? The question was when they the people got off and they went into the, oh, the doctor, cattle. Yeah. Where did the cattle go? Did they so that's the, the reason I mentioned Bay is at, right there at Seed Landing, there's a trough that goes about 100 yards down into the river. Cattle don't like to go across the river if they don't have to. And so they would herd them into this trough for the canal, which was angled down to the river. So they could push them on out and make them swim across to the other side. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Okay, I've got two kind of related questions um, about the marker trees. All right. So, are you mainly interested in the ones near rivers, or are there others that are away from rivers? And while you've been looking for them, have you found any trace of antebellum structures? Found any what? Antebellum structures. Oh no, I have found any tractors. But those, the trail marker trees um, mark places along established Indian trails. They mark uh, in particular river fords or places like the Santa Fe, uh, the natural bridge at the Santa Fe. Um, they're, they're, some of them are right out in the middle of the forest. Now you have to remember now that that was all longleaf pine forest back then and oak trees were rare and they were limited to hammocks and along the, the, the river margin. And so a deformed shaped oak tree standing in the middle of a pine forest would stick out. So those things were really noticeable markers. Nowadays, all of those trees that I found are in the middle of second, third, fourth growth hardwoods. And everything else has been cut two or three times, but they left the trail marker tree alone. And uh, that was because up until the 1920s, those were still important. There weren't any road signs. There were not very many roads, really. And the first highway map for Florida was produced in 1921. And basically, they were all unpaved roads. And uh, so those trail marker trees continue to be important for a long time. I was just curious. Uh, in 2015, uh, I, I crossed uh, the St. John's River on a ferry. Yeah. Uh, which which ferry was that? Or what's the story on that one? That was that was actually called the Alachua Ferry because it came over to the big area known as Alachua. That ferry was in existence. That's probably the first ferry ever in Florida. Right? Ah. Probably was there from the the English period of, you know, 1760s or so. And it operated right up until about five years ago, we got a big hurricane and it tore up the landing, tore up the ferry. And it, it went from the Ocala Forest side across to the town of Wilatka, which is in the process of becoming a big fancy fishing resort now, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, but I never took it, it, it was, a, it was operated not by a cable because the St. John's is wide. Right. It was operated by, they had a little steamboat and later on a little motorboat that, that, that was attached to the ferry and took it across. We were actually going to a kind of fish market restaurant there. Excuse me? We were going to a fish market restaurant. Yeah, there. there's two restaurants there that have been there forever. Both of them are good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, I've I've got another question um, from the online. There was an 1861 law passed to create a bridge at Zipperer's Ferry. Was it built? Yes, the Zipper the Zippers were a family of um, uh, religious dissidents from Germany, and those dissidents got kicked out and went to Austria. And then from Austria, things got tough, and they went to England, got on a boat, and came over and got off at uh, South Carolina. The South Carolina governor created a little colony for the Zippers. Uh, there's a name for that religious group and I can't think what it is now, but but anyway, um, Salzburgers from the town of Salzburg in Austria, right on the border with Germany. Anyway, the Salzburgers were, uh, you know, uh, like Puritans in a sense. And uh, they came late though in the 1700s and amongst them were Zippers and a zipper name means living on the Zipper River somewhere in Europe, which I haven't been able to find out where that is. But Mr. Solomon Zipper 
built a ferry at what was later called Nova's Ferry. And then they had a bridge and then the bridge collapsed and then they, great, they had a ferry again. And then a bridge was finally built there again and it collapsed and there's, there was still a bar, there's a bridge, steel bridge there now and uh, at uh, Nobles Ferry or Gibson Park. But anyway, uh, Mr. Zippers, that whole bunch of zippers settled right there, which was odd because that was not prime land for farming. I see, uh, you know, there's it's full of sinkholes there. Yeah, one of my friends back here who knows all about that. And so, but these people were not farmers. When they came over here, they wanted to be craftsmen. They wanted to be wheel makers and forge operators, et cetera. So they decided to go into the ferry business. So Mr. Zipper had that ferry there at Nobles Ferry and his, I'm forgetting how, whether it's a son or his brother, went down to where I showed that uh, trail marker tree that was cut down, Rossiter's so-called um, Rossiter's Ferry, but it was actually owned and operated by Mr. Thomas Zipper for a number of years, right there where the Indian, right above where the Indian Ford was. So yeah, the Zippers did have uh, at least two ferries and another Zipper operated one further down the river at a place that was called Swanee Post Office after the Civil War. So they were big into ferry operation. I would think that that one is, um, you were asking why they would put a ferry there. I would think that's because that's where the road was. Is that US 90? Because there is an old trail there. US 90 is uh, the replacement for Stagecoach Road, which is County Road 132, which went from St. Augustine, crossed the river at Swanee Springs, and went across and ended up at Ellaville. And uh, Ellaville. so uh, Route 90 follows that route and the Interstate 10 follows that route. You know, the roads we have in place now, a lot of them actually started out as Indian trails or the general course of that, yeah. But was that zipper also? Was that, or was the ferry a little bit different place? The Stagecoach Ferry goes right, uh, the Stagecoach Road passes within about three miles of Zipper's Ferry. There's another road that connects down okay. from there. It's so uh, north of Live Oak, yes. Also had a question about the names of the, the families. The Rossiter was one, and Townsend was one, and Comer was one. I know the name Rossiter from, you know, uh, you know they, they settled around Coco. And we have Townsend that came, I don't know if it's the same Townsend. Uh, there's all kinds of, there was uh, two big migrations of Townsends from South Carolina. One group came to Alachua, Gilchrist County. The other group is Madison, Lafayette County. Mm -hmm. My wife is related to both of them like eight generations back. Because I'm not thinking the Townsends at Cross Creek. Yeah. The other one is Cummer. Is that the, the same as, because that, that sounds like a big operation. Right, the Cummer Art Gallery in Jackson. That's right. Yeah. yeah the, Cummer was a lumber baron who came down from, after they cut out the Midwest, Michigan and Wisconsin and those places, they cut all the great gigantic white pine. They came to Florida. His operation was over in Fernandina Beach, north of Jacksonville, where they could load ships there. Coming into the St. John's River was not good because there's a big bar there and it's bad for sailing ships. So they, all this lumber from the lower Swanning was shipped to New England and the Caribbean and Europe to back in the, uh, after the, you know, when they were building these towns, the brownstones in New York and Boston and Philadelphia and places, those are all built with Florida longleaf pine. <laughs> yeah. Cumber was a, a wealthy, he, he, uh, you know, he he didn't come over here very often. He didn't allow his girls to come anywhere near the the logging camps. But they finally they donated the last of that. The Vista Landing became part of the Lower Swanee that, the Wildlife Refuge two two years ago, something like that. That was the last. That was a, a lumber camp originally there. Yeah. Okay, I've got um, one more question online, and then we'll do one more question from the room if anybody has them. Um, but the question from online is about if there were different or easier ways that people who had money came to the state. Yes, okay, so people that, I, basically I was talking about here today about people that came to 
were small farmers that came down to homestead in the area known as Alachua. If you came down and went across the Beaufort Ferry on the Withlacoochee, and instead of turning left and going to Alachua, you turn right and go into Madison County, you were coming down to grow cotton. And those people came down as, a, as with lots of wagons, lots of slaves, a whole bunch of money, and they were intent on uh, large scale cotton plant and the families like the Mosleys, the first governor of Florida, the Paramours and others were all big cotton planters. Of course, all that kind of came crashing down in 1865. <laughs> the Mosleys had three ferries that they operated. All right, any last question from the room? We'll take two. I can. Um, just wanted to ask, it sounded like if you had a ferry in a good location, it was kind of like a license to print money. You're kind of guaranteed a good. Absolutely. Ferry. So was how did you establish a ferry? Was there any sort of fighting for prime locations or how did that happen? Well, you have to apply to uh, the district court, the county commission or the state, mostly the state to obtain a license. Very few people did that to start with because the licenses were incredibly expensive, somewhere between a hundred and a thousand dollars. A hundred dollars back then was like fifty thousand dollars. I mean, so you so uh, very few people had the money. And usually the people that came down were related to the guy that was the sheriff or the mayor or whoever that would do the enforcement. And so there wasn't anybody to really force you to pay. Uh, so like the Blunt Ferry was originally started by the Blunt family in 1837, right at the Georgia Florida line. That was a big route for people coming into Florida. And they operated it for four or five years and they sold it to Captain Billy Hooker. And he operated for a while, sold it to Mike Frank, et cetera. And it finally got licensed somewhere along the line. <laughs> Yes, sir. I have a kind of a specific question. I've been puzzled by a few pilings I've seen in the river above, above Holton Springs, above the river camp, about River Mile 135 to 140. And it, there's piles on both sides of the river. Yeah, that was a failed railroad. In 1911, the Florida Railway started, a, they had a line building from Jacksonville right along the section line coming directly due west to end on the river at big shows. Uh, and they they, they grubbed, grubbed it out. They cut all the trees, they grubbed it, leveled it, and started laying ties and tracks. And then they had another line coming from the vicinity of Quitman, Georgia, coming down to go across the Alapaha and then across to Suwannee. And those two lines, in 1911, that railroad went bankrupt and they abandoned those, and they had already built a bridge across the uh, swine where you saw those pilings. Those pilings are 60 feet tall originally. And uh, in 1911, when the Corps of Engineers came to survey the Suwannee River, they were going to uh, dredge out the shoals so that you could get steamboats up. And fortunately, they didn't do that. But they dredged up to Branford uh, in the 1880s, but not above that. Uh, that uh, they encountered that bridge, and they said old demolished bridge, but it, it basically had it been abandoned. I've been there at low tide, and there I found several artifacts or bolts and and uh, um, spikes and pieces of railroad tools and stuff. I talked to a railroad folks that know history and they say no they never did that they never built that there but well i don't know how those spikes got there <laughs> but uh i went there twice at low at very low water to investigate that it was quite an undertaking the uh, the other one with the bridge on that same track straight line down to the river the one that goes a few miles northwest of that went across the Alapaha river and that was abandoned, but became a highway bridge. They used the existing uh, cut through for a road and uh, built a, uh, a 
the early steel bridge there. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and um, end there, okay. but thank you all for coming. Oh, wait a minute. There's okay. one guy here. The Bradford Swinkins, was that a motorized design or that a pulley system? Some of those swing bridges, remarkably, were turned by hand. You had, uh, in the center, you had a big, uh, a big pier, built big cylindrical pier. You can go and look at the Drew Bridge and you can see this. Up at the top, you have a circular railroad track and small steel wheels. And so that, and, and on bearings and the whole thing turned on that. And there were slots up there where two guys would go out and stick a long pole down in there and turn the bridge by hand. I don't know, but you know, you're talking you're back in the days of, uh, you know, steamboats and horses and stuff, and time was probably not that important. The important thing was to get through that gap with your load, you know, and so there were some, uh, there, was, there was a turn, there's a railroad bridge, the, Ella, the Live Oak, uh, Gulf and Perry Railroad, LRPG uh, Railroad at, at um, Dowling Park so started out as a turn bridge, but by the time, and it was another one of those, by the time they got that going, the, the steamboats weren't running anymore, so they, they, they never really completed that structure completely. Is motion now existing whatsoever? They're still operational anywhere, anywhere in the world? Yeah. I used to camp there when I was a graduate student in Miami, and and you could go out, you had to you could go out there and turn it by hand yourself. Yeah. They use it for transporting sugar cane to their I used to camp in was just like really primitive, you know, and now it's like a luxury place for RVs. <laughs> I thank you for your questions. I appreciate that.